Well, good morning. Hey, it's nine o'clock, nine o'clock on a Wednesday. And uh, Gerhard, you're, it's the afternoon in uh, Norway, huh? I got to go there one of these days. Um, Andre from Belgium. Really nice to have you guys here. Tom Johnson from PA. Oh, Philadelphia, PA. Okay. And then... WC, the best part of the week. Morning from North Carolina. Thank you. North Carolina, again, beautiful state. Really love it. Okay, Tom, however you pronounce that, Mansiki, Jiki, whatever. Um, so, you know what? We're going to start today with a special deal. I just played When Sunny Gets Blue, and that's uh, on uh, Mankun Makungi. Okay. Um, enunciation is not my forte, I'll tell you that. Anyway, um, we're going to uh, – let's talk about When Sunny Gets Blue. Um, if you don't know that lesson or you don't know the song, I, I've got it on the website, of course. And so you can check it out. Uh, and it's a wonderful song. Uh, Johnny Mathis had a big hit with it. You can do it as a waltz. <laughs> or a ballad. Anyway, you can do it many ways. But, you know, I was thinking, uh, let's let's do this this morning. You know, the song starts on a melody note of C, and it's like got a G minor written over it. But, you know, traditionally what you would do is you would play 2-5 of G to bring the tonal center of G out. So you could go with an A minor. And then to A flat seven with a substitute for D. And then, okay. Um, and then, um, there you have it. So you go, sunny gets blue. Or you could go, okay. So that's one of the things. Uh, so proceeding it with a two five of the chord coming up is definitely a jazz dealy bob dj from diddler from d this is oh this is did didier from france hello thank you for joining us there's a place and the men don't care because they like to see them bear um so um Okay, so back to Sunny Gets Blue. And then the chords go, goes to the, the song is in F, right? 
So, but it starts on the two chord. Um, and then what I like to go chromatically up. Okay, to the B flat minor. You could go backwards. You could go. Um, I'm going from D minor here. Something like that. Um, or. So we have. And that's D minor, D flat seven, C minor, B seven, and, uh, B flat minor. Who said jazz car chords are hard? Look at all these. You know, you, you just go like this, you know. So, see that? Okay, so, um, and then we got. And then we could go. Uh, it's now to a. And then it. it resolves to back to an F. It doesn't really resolve. It just, that's four minor and then goes back to one. Now, the next chord is this thing, which is the, the slide that I like to call for an ending. This thing. But it's in the melody, so that's why it's so cool to learn this song. Then. Um, so we're, we've got this. And then it's F with the A bass. And then A flat minor. And then you go, go like this to this D flat, uh, flat seven, uh, flat five. So. And then C minor. And then. And then it's E minor uh, seven, or I like to play flat five there. And then you could go to D flat, uh, excuse me, E flat, sharp 11, and then to my, the D major seven, instead of to A. This sounds better with the chromatic sounds. Now this goes, um, an F minor, I could change that to an F7 sharp five. So we have, and then, so there, there is a B7, uh, B9, B9 flat, or B7 flat nine. Boy, we got a lot of people out of the country, don't we? Um, cheers from Italy. Holy cow. Hello there. Santa. Uh, however that goes. Um, thank you for joining us. And also from the Ukraine, Stepan from the Ukraine. Well, son of a gun. Boy, we sure get a, the, on the Wednesday uh, morning, we sure get a lot of people from overseas. It's really neat. Yeah, that's happy to have you with us. By the way, Gail is running all those things that says Rich Severson, that's Gail making comments. And Wes, my son, is over here working the cameras and the sound and all that good stuff. 
And there he is. Nope, that's not U.S. So, um, no, still not you. Anyway, um, so Wes is coming over and he is doing this for me. And so we do have an electronic tip jar for Wes. If you'd like to get in and contribute, that would be cool. Okay. There he is. He had to plug in the camera. What a handsome young boy. He just moved down here to Pismo Beach. Central California, that's where we are. I wish they all could be California, girl. Ah, anyway, so uh, that's some, some different things about when Sunny gets blue. Let's play it as a waltz. this lick where you go up just the thing you could go like this mm -hmm. oh, yeah right how did it go something like you go or backwards or you could go So we have. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What movie was that from? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, did you get your coffee? Everybody got their coffee? Hope so. Don't be putting any Jack Daniels in it, by the way. Um, okay, so there it is. Now, our uh, our camp, we're getting more and more people signed up for camp. And I was a little bit worried about that. So now we're going, I've got some feelers out for adding another teacher. So, so far, it's me, Todd Johnson, and Mike Dana. And I'm going to add a guest um, instructor. So it's going to be like a normal one. So it's going to be fun. And the protocols are all in place. Everything's looking good. Kevin Grouty, hi, Richard Rachi, right here from down the road in YLP. Well, no kidding. <laughs> we were just there uh, last week in YLP. Yosemite Lakes Park. Wonderful development. By the way, I just worked on this guitar. This is my Eagle Classic. And uh, I ordered this uh, special. And what I did is I raised the pickups. I never did that with this guitar. And you see how the pickups are off the, the top. So just supported by those little tiny washers there. And some guitars, it makes a big difference. Other guitars, it doesn't. And I got to say, it didn't really make a whole lot of difference on this guitar. So if you have a guitar that this guitar was already pretty alive and everything, and it looked, uh, you see, you can you could slip a pick in there if you wanted to, see? Okay. So um, I don't know. I, I mean, the guitar already sounded great, so that's why I didn't do it But earlier. I don't know. It's pretty cool. Um, anyway, so, but I did that. I never had done that before. So this is my Eagle Classic. If you want an Eagle Classic, call me and you can... We'll get you a good price on it, and you'll have it within a, a year and a half. That's how long it takes. 
So you've got plenty of time to save your money. And then when you do get it, what do you got? You got a fantastic jazz guitar and uh, uh, if you don't like, don't want it, sell it. Do your guitars have names? They do. <laughs> but they, they, like my L4, we always call it Elfer. Uh, let's see. What were some of the other names, Gail, that we used to call guitars? Uh, my Schaefer uh, was Ed Schaefer. Used to call him Eddie. Go get Eddie. Um, <clears throat> but you know, I've sold the ones that that I had names for most of the time. Um, yes, and so do our cars. <laughs> cars have names. That's right. You know, it's funny. Projection is an interesting thing that that the human mind does, isn't it? You know, when you project your personality onto a car or onto something innate or, or even onto other people, when you project and you think, you know, like your car, you left it out in the rain. Oh, man, it's probably cold and it's shivering. And, you know, it, really, it's just wet, you know. Um, but you, you do that projection and you project onto dogs, you know, and you got to realize they're a dog. It's weird. And I think you project onto people and you project this is how you feel. Therefore, they should feel that way as well. But you got to remember that doesn't happen. And uh, I learned that lesson all the time. Well, how come you don't feel the same way? Don't what's what's wrong with you? So uh, projection is is a weird thing. Kirby from Newbury Park. All right, go Panthers. Kirby lives where Gail and I went to school, Newbury Park High School. <laughs> and Kirby's coming to camp, right, Kirby? And uh, love the tailpiece. Yes, it's the finger tailpiece. They went to this. You can pick these up for around 150 bucks. Uh, yes, my quilter is an eight inch speaker. That's all I ever use is the eight inch. The eight inch has a wider dispersion pattern. The bigger the speaker, the more directional the sound. So well, the smaller speaker, it fills the room better. So have I got the new site up, the one taking the place of 99 cent guitar. Well, 99 cent guitar lessons is still there. But Guitar College Go Play Music, which was the streaming site, is gone. And yes, we are still working on it. We have, I think, about 150 lessons on it now. So we should be releasing it pretty soon, don't you think, honey? Did I ever play at Casey's Tavern? Where is that? I, I don't. In Newbury Park, I played at the Red Robin. And there was another place that a real dive. I, I forget the name of it. Uh, it's gone. Um, oh, in Canoga Park? No, I never played in, in Canoga Park there at Casey's Tavern. But I used to live behind the Canoga Bowl when it was brand new. When I moved, with my parents moved in 1955 to Canoga Park, it was the edge of Los Angeles County. Well, actually, there was Canoga Park, and then there was Woodland or Woodland Hills, which was very rural. Here's L.A. Here's Hollywood. Here's uh, Van Nuys. Here's Canoga Park. So this was the edge of town, and it was horse property and stuff. And uh, on my street was Jerry Mathers. And um, so <laughs> we lived there. And then they built, they wanted to put this, this bowling alley right in the back of our house. Everybody was up in arms about it, didn't want them. Well, they ended up getting to do the bowling alley. And so we got free bowling. Everybody on the street got free bowling. 
Can you believe that? So we went over there. We're over there all the time. Sherman Way and Canoga Park. I never played there. Thank God. The Valley, I do not like. Um, let's see, where are we at here? Rosemead, California. Wow. Okay. Isn't that by the racetrack? Isn't this Santa Anita over there? Hope to have the Guitar College Library together. Oh, that's us saying that. I have 450 lemons uploaded so far. So you should be able to find something out of 450, wouldn't you think? Now, you know, the quality, you know, the early videos, the quality is not, you know, the hottest. And we've been, actually, it's my job to re make those better, but then it's, it's a slow process. But I tell you what, the information is still the same, right? So don't get hung up on the quality. But they got they get better and better and better quality. So who knows uh, what lesson is better quality than the other? I don't know. But uh, we're going to get them up there, and then you can we'll work on improving the quality. Okay, so you saw Eric Clapton's Blackie Strat at the ABBA Museum in Stockton. Oh, Stockholm. By the way, I know the guys. It was the Burst brother, Dave Belzer, Dave Belzer and Drew, Dave and Drew Berlin, I think his name is. And those were the vintage buyers for Guitar Center. And I did an interview with them and we never got to release it. I got it somewhere on, on them buying Blackie and they bought that guitar for, I want to say, you know, around $150,000, something like that. But there's an interesting story about guitars, right? There is a fellow that lives in town here and he Ended up acquiring from his father when he was a little boy a Fender Strat with the serial number 0001. The very first Stratocaster. His father was friends with some guys who, who knew Leo Fender and something like that. And anyway... They got him this guitar and he had it as a boy. So he did, but that, you know, you don't know what you got, you know, like it's a, okay. Yeah. So what's first one, big deal. Well, anyway, he, uh, he ended up kind of losing it. I don't know. There's a weird story on how he lost it, but it's all on the, on the uh, internet about it. If you look up Fender Stratocaster 0001, it's about it. And his name's Richard. Um, so anyway, uh, David Gilmore ended up with it. Now, David decided to get rid of his guitars, and they all went on auction, and it brought a ton of money. And uh, David was gracious enough to give, uh, to give Richard uh, a giant sum. So... Interesting, you know. Uh, collectibles, who knows? Okay, so yeah, that was Blackie. So there you go, a little story. Uh, are those micro tuners on the bridge? Looks like it. No, and you don't use them for that. You use these to adjust the tension of the string. So the closer the tension is to the top, if you can, can you see that? You see how they're not all even? The high, I use the higher strings, these skinnier strings, with less tension. If the more I press that down towards the top, it puts more down pressure on the bridge. Therefore, makes the string uh, tighter feeling. So that's why I, I do it with the low strings to make the, these strings less floppy. And then these strings can be the same amount of tension. So I just kind of even it up like that. So they kind of go up at a slant. 
don't use these as fine tuners because you'll strip you'll strip these things so you can't if you want to change them you got to press down on it and then screw because i've had guitars that i've gotten from people and they ended up doing that and you end up stripping those out because changing tension is rough what do i think of the Amper for Amper uh, Epiphone Joe Pass Amper 2 jazz guitar. Hi, Donald Day. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think they're they're pretty good. You know, they feel like a is that it? I haven't played one in a very, very long time, but uh, you know, they're priced, they're priced good. They've got the poly finish on them, which doesn't allow it to breathe, but it doesn't crack or anything, or it doesn't, well, I take that back. They could crack, yeah. But, you know, I think it's good. You know, it's, um, it's the kind of guitar that, you know, you buy it and you play for a little bit and now your eye starts to wander in. You think, oh, I'd like to have this or that, or this or that, or this or that. That's why the, the old saying, the, the saying, buy once, cry once. Buy the, the most expensive guitar you can afford, and generally that'll, that'll satisfy that. It's like you lose money every time you sell and upgrade and sell and upgrade and all that, especially on production guitars that, you know, like this guitar, uh, it takes a year and a half to, to get one of these. So it's they don't exactly fall off the trees, fall out of the trees. No, I don't play you. I see you in my dreams. I, I started to learn that a couple times and never did. You know, there's so many nice recordings of that. So many guys can just rip that up. But let's move on. Let's play all of me. And All of Me is a song that we're going to be using in, at the camp. We use songs to illustrate jazz ideas in, at the camp. And uh, well, let's just play it. What the heck? Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, I thought that would go a little longer. This band, you know, they end early and stuff. I don't know what the hell they're thinking. Anyway, that was all of me. Yeah, that's a wonderful song. What I saw a thing about here. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, do you, uh, good timing. My guitar teacher gave me all of me to learn a couple of weeks ago. Oh, good. Well, you should come to camp, Andrew. Do you ever use an effects pedal board? Well, yeah. Uh, when when I you know play those kind of gigs, I don't have a pedal board. I just use like a uh, <laughs> Digitech, one of those ones that's got everything in it. I just use that. I I use the Roland one, and I use the Digitech. Um. God, I haven't used that thing in so long. I used to use it at church all the time and have all these programs in it. One thing I hated about a pedal board and a volume pedal is I ended up standing on one leg for the gig, you know, one on the pedal board, one on this, and it's like, ah, oh, you get done and my legs hurt. So I don't know what to think about pedal boards. I just, life is so much easier without them. Uh, um, so, I look at some guys play like, um, I don't know, Jeff Beck, you know, I don't see him hanging around a pedal board, you know. Um, same with uh, the blues guy. Um, who am I think, thinking of, Wes? Uh, Joe uh, Bonamas. I, I don't see him, you know, with a one foot on a pedal board, you know, and the other, you know. Like girl Larry Carlton always had a volume pedal, you know. So I don't know. So anyway, there's all of me. Now, I always thought that song was hokey. You know what I mean? It's like something Lawrence Welk would play, you know? And and <laughs> so, but you know what? I've gotten so many views on that, that lesson that people obviously don't think that. So I don't know what I'm thinking. I must have caught an episode of Lawrence Welk. Now, when I watch Lawrence Welk nowadays, I think, God, those guys are good. Um, but back then, it's like, well, wait a minute, man. What about this? I want to do that, you know. Ha, help me. Ah, woo, 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 woo. You know what I mean? So um, that's when I was in high school. But uh, turns out, like, when I do um, some guitar shows, I play all of me. People, people respond to that tune, man. It's weird. So it's a great little tune, and it's got a lot of dominant chords, and it makes you try to figure out what the heck to play over. Uh, so, okay. You thought that song has been played too much. Well, that's true. That's, that's a good point. Like uh, any big classic song, Girl from Ipanema, you know, uh, this, this classic example, been played so much that it's like it and you've heard so many bad versions you have a, it's got a bad rap but then you go back and listen to the original and you think wow that's beautiful okay where are we at a 1980 gibson es 175 blonde 4k is too much probably yeah you know what I think you're better off buying one from the late 90s, uh, 2000. They, it, it has a higher fret. They, they went to a lower lower fret and, and the older ones. Ah, I don't like them. I'm not a big fan of 175s anyways. The pickup's in the wrong spot. Okay, you thought that's uh, where we are. Thanks, all you do. I bought many of your courses. Thank you. Can you suggest a good jazz guitar that's less than a thousand dollars? The Epiphone Joe Pass, yeah. Six ninety nine. Are you out of your mind? So. Uh, Well, if you uh, Eastman, if you sometimes you can find an Eastman 503 
or around that price. And uh, again, I'd snag it. 503. The 371 is um, not the best sounding, I, I don't think, you know. You might as well buy, well, not true. Uh, let's see. I don't know. What about like an Ibanez? Thing? Well, the Ibanez art core is okay. Uh, buy the most expensive one you can find. Uh, but there's one that has two floating pickups. And I've, I played that one. I thought, well, that's pretty good. You know what else is a nice guitar? If you can find one, is a Guild. And I want to become a dealer of them. It's a deal, uh, Guild uh, Sav Save uh, X150. Uh, but again, those are probably more money. Let's see if I, do I have anything left that's $1,000? Let's see. I'll have to think about that. You have to email me that. I'll have to think if I got anything up here. Obviously, these aren't. So I brought this. Here's my L5, right? And here's my my Super Eagle. And is that Pat Evans? Pat Evans is at the... Here's Patty. Ben, how you doing, Ben? Do you like Hofner guitars? Um, you know, I used to. Um, that was, I, I yeah, you know, I had a uh, a few of them. The problem with uh, like the Jazzica again, it's it's twenty four frets, and so the pickup is back here. The closer the pickup is to the bridge, the tinier the sound. So I had some uh, presidents, and I recorded an album with a president, and that was nice. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, there's a Jessica. Good grief. Are you kidding? 3700 bucks. Wow. Um, well, there you have it. Hmm. Uh, you know what? Um <laughs> As far as the uh, going back to, can I suggest a guitar for under a thousand dollars? First off, you have to decide: do you have a, want a sixteen inch or a, or a seventeen inch? That's the major decision that you got to figure out. Okay, and the scale length: do you want twenty five and a half or do you want twenty four and three quarters? Once you get that squared away, then you can start looking for the right guitar. Okay. Now, sometimes you can get an old, like Pat. Pat, I sold him my X50, which was a 19, what year was that, Pat? 1952 or three or 59? God, and, and that thing sounds fantastic. And uh, so that's a nice guitar. So you can sometimes buy an older kind of, those were considered student guitars, but you, you listen to them nowadays, you think, Holy crap, wow, that sounds good. And if you could pick those up, a little over $1,000. Okay, where are we at now? Chord corner. All right, so here's what we're going to do with the chord corner. Everybody got their guitar in 1956. Oh, somebody asked me about the Crown Vic. Did I have a name for the Crown Vic? Yes, Vicky. But I call it the 55, too. I like that. Or L5, Gibson L5, new ones are good. Yes, they are. Very good. I like them better than a lot of the older ones. And um, a friend of mine, uh, I, I won't say who, but uh, anyways, uh, he had been searching for an L5 and Yes, you know, this one had, did, you know, this is, you get in the older ones, you know, and sometimes they've been misused, mistreated. They don't sound very, as good. Some sound great and they want a fortune for them. He ended up buying a new one and the new ones, you know, are built really beautifully. So, but they got a price tag, a big one. What, 10.5? Good God. 
I never used to like to spend more than 10 on a car. That shows you how old I am. All right, so anyway, let's take a look at this. Here's an A minor chord, right? Now, actually, this guitar does sound good, doesn't it? Oh, gosh, I forgot to screw this in. Anyway, now here's an A minor chord. You know what? If you would take and add a note and just add this note here or this note here, there's an A minor 9. This is an A minor 6, 7, if you want to call it. Here's the 6. Here's the flat 7. And now I could, of course, use other notes. I could go. With that finger here. Now, for the next group, I would maybe put my finger here on a D. So I go. And then maybe put my little finger on a, a minor seven. Or I might go minor six. In this case, this would be called a minor 13. Um, and then up here, I would put this little finger here. And now I've got an A minor nine. So minor seven. Now, I can also go like this with it, like a little pull-off. Okay, so when I'm playing an A minor chord, So all I'm doing is taking a bar on an A minor here and then adding this note, this note, this. You could add this, but it doesn't do any good. It's doubling that. So just add a D. And then uh, do that. Whoops. Something like that. Okay. Ouch. That hurts. That's why I don't do that. You know, it hurts. Don't do it. I guess you got to build these muscles up. These muscles get weak after a while if you don't use them. Um, doing these kind of chords, it's good for you. Build that muscle back up. It's all about muscle, but not too much because you, then you're not limber. What kind of strings are you using? Uh, guitar strings. Are you like to use guitar strings? Okay, smart ass. So this is a 13, a 15, a 20, 28, 38, 48 hike. And I use Theodario Chrome Brights. I buy an extra light set. They're flat wound. I throw, it comes with a 10 and a 14 and I put them in my pile. I have about 300 of each if anybody needs any 13s or yeah, 13s or four or uh, no 10s. It's 10s and 14, 10 and 14, 10 and 14. And I replaced those with a 13, 15. Steve Stewart. Hi, Steve Stewart. How are you? I hope you are doing well this morning. Are you still in Santa Barbara? 
Uh, Steve Stewart, in, I think, lives in Santa Barbara, one of the nicest towns in the country. <clears throat> Good for you, Steve. Thank you, Rich. I'll keep an eye out for those models. Okay, do that. So, uh, Wes, did you get, speaking of guitars, let's take a look over at Reverb.com. And let's look at two guitars that are real guitars that you hardly see anymore. <laughs> okay, that one's, well, aren't they the same? No? No. What, what are they? The thirty uh, forty three ninety five. You enlarge that one. That's a tenor guitar. All right. So this is a nineteen thirty seven. Of course, you can read, right? That's a tenor guitar. Four strings. That's all you need, right? Four strings. But gosh, look at the tuners on that. Isn't that a trip? It's got banjo tuner. It's got a nice crack there. But there is like a guitar that probably will never go down in value, I guess. But, you know, you just you just kind of get it and play it if you're made out of money. That's got to be a different pick guard. And I question the pickup, too. Uh, so you'd have to research that. I didn't look at that that much. But you know how people say, you know, Wes Montgomery didn't start playing guitar until he's 21. Well, what they forgot to tell you is his brother bought him a tenor guitar. He didn't start playing six string, but when he was, you know, young, he played a tenor guitar. And a tenor guitar is just four strings, You're, and that's all you need, right? You don't need those low strings. I've been, I've been tempted to, well, I can't afford that, to mess around with that. But there is something I think that's kind of cool. Um. So, Wes, the other one is uh, the check out. Check the other. There's the other one. Look at the price of that. What, what does that say? What's the price of that? Good God. All right. There is. See, I, that pick guard isn't right either, I don't think. You have to research that. But uh, it's rare that a pick guard would survive that long. But that pick guard is huge. But here is a, here is a 150. So, you know. We're talking the Charlie Christian pickup, which have a definite, its own distinct sound. I mean, it's crazy. Mitch Holder loves those pickups. And they're very, they, they're, they're uh, a special metal that they're made out of. Uh, it's like you could make a nuclear bomb or, or make a guitar pickup. It's got some kind of metal. It's radioactive. Looks like it's got some cracks there, but I mean, I first saw one of these live, a fellow by the name of John Morrell. John Morrell came to my class. Do you remember this, Steve Stewart? Came yeah, to uh, Orby's class, uh, John Morrell, and I forget who else came, and they came and sat in and played, and he had one of these. Um. Uh, so anyway, that is a, a guitar. Now it's kind of, I think that price, I've played those <laughs> guitars before. Um, so, you know, <laughs> you can't play anywhere. That's got a, a, a real strat on the lights, you know, one of those things that makes it dimmer or not because they buzz like crazy. But uh, there's ways around that. But they also have a V-neck. And that V-neck, is it looks like this. So if you play with a traditional thumb behind the fingerboard uh, right here, it, you're actually your thumb is out here, and it's really weird. It's hard. So they're made for your thumb to be up here, um, something like that to play. And so uh, those V-necks... I started playing one one time and I had to put it down because it freaking hurt my hand. And I almost bought that guitar. Um, a guy had it at a guitar show. And at the time, I think he was asking $3,000. And look at the price of them now. 
Yes, a Charlie Christian pickup in his 350. Okay, great stuff with the A minor chord change. Thank you. Uh, do you know how weird it is being the same age as old people? <laughs> well, old people is anybody 15 years older than you. You know, so if you're 70, you know, somebody's 85, yeah, they're old, right? If you're 40, somebody's 55, wow, they're old. You know, if you're 15, somebody's 30 is old. If you're one and somebody's 16, they just got their license, man, they're old. All right. So um, let me just play a song. I'm not, a, I got to remember, I'm not a jukebox. Let me think about, I'm going to play the song, Don't Get Around Much Anymore. And it's a finger style song. And um, I do it in the key of A. That's a fun little tune, man. You should learn that. I, I have a that arrangement written out. And uh, Jim Rolfe, and you should get it. Jim Rolfe, how you doing, Jim Rolfe? Are you using a... Yes, yes. It's not on my amp or anything. It's this unit going on to the, to the 
stream. I don't know what's going on with that compression thing. I don't get it. But um, when I tape it in here of the sound, it sounds great. I go out and I listen to the playback and the guy is compressed like crazy. So I don't know what's going on. I don't get it. Anyway, Howard Morgan had an arrangement in Guitar Player Magazine. Don't get around in the 80s. Did my best back then. Your arrangement sounds great. Thank you, Gerhard. Thank you, Dave. Jim Rolfe. Okay, morning, Jimmy. Oh, morning, Jim. No, that's Gail. Okay, what is next up? Okay, next up on our show is uh, myself with Mike Dana doing this uh, song called There Will Never Be Another You. And it's with Roy Carlson on bass and Brian Amata on drums, excellent drummer, who has left the planet. Well, sad day. Uh, anyway, um, okay, uh, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked. Looking at a note here. Uh, Joe Pass played harmonic minor over many changes. Yeah, we'll talk about that. So anyway, here's, um, here's that video. Hope you enjoy it. And uh, the thing to that I want to point out uh, as you listen to this, the song since has got real big breaks in it. Mm. One, two, three, four. So there's a lot of room for answering in other words. Okay, so uh, Mike and I are kind of doing that. So you might want to pay attention to that because it's a fun, fun song to play. Okay. Anyway, that was Road Song by West Montgomery. And now we're going to do a jazz standard called There Will Never Be Another You. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. That was There Will Never Be Another. Do you ever think about scales and arpeggios when you improvise, or do you, that is, some point where the fingers do the walking? 
Uh, yes, all of the above. Yeah, everything you, um, Howard called it, uh, Howard Roberts called it the big now, where everything you've learned in the past comes together with everything you're trying to do and everything. So, um, yeah, you, you're, you're borrowing from stuff you played in the past, you're trying new things, you're sequencing, you're playing different scales, you're playing arpeggios, so it's really all of the above. So don't let anybody, you know, you, you gotta learn licks, you gotta learn arpeggios, you gotta learn scales, it, you know, and that, those are the fundamentals. So anyway, um, so hey, what do you think about this? Remember this guitar? I'm thinking, you know, um, so does this sound any better than what I've been playing? Stand. Now you didn't get to hear anything of what I just said. <laughs> uh. Uh. Anyway, now I know how Gail feels. Does this guitar sound any better? Okay, so anyway, uh, you must have been playing together for a long time. Not so, actually, not at all. Mike and I went to different schools together. It's funny, we have similar backgrounds as, as a lot of guys. You know, they played rock and roll, and then they got into playing jazz and studied uh, from everybody they could. He used to drive down to L.A. from Fresno and, and took some lessons from Joe. And... Uh, so yeah, we're all doing, took that same path. So, you know, a lot of those guys, you know, who have had that experience uh, kind of play the same songs and, you know, so that's the jazz vocabulary. Okay. You know, so Mike was playing Wes was asking me, what guitar is that? And it's a Godin. Uh, I forget the model number. Let me show you. Um, anyway, it's a, a nice sounding guitar. But I'll tell you, a lot of people hear with their eyes. And um, when you show up at a jazz gig, sometimes, you know, they're looking for that nice big guitar in the fat sound. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of tellies sound good, you know. But I, I just, it's everything that goes with it. Okay. That's a nice sound. All right, let's learn a lick. You want to learn a lick? Woohoo! Let's learn a lick. So um, this lick is over an E minor chord. I don't have it written. All right, the Gibson you have, it's a bit louder and a bit deeper. Is the blonde here it is for sale? No, I don't think so. Maybe not now. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so this lick is around an E minor chord. And here's the philosophy of the... Ah, oh, jeez. Let me tune this. I'm sorry, guys. All 
I just had some bacon grease on my fingers, so should be able to play a little faster. All right, so um, the lick is around an E minor chord. And what we're going to do is we're going to play E minor, B minor, E minor 7, B minor 7 in the lick. So first, let's take a look at what a B, E minor 7 arpeggio looks like. And so here's here it is. E. Now let's play it backwards. Okay. Now, so I have D, B, G, E. And the permutations of this arpeggio would be what we just played. <coughs> then starting on the fifth, th flat three. Root, flat seven, flat three, root, flat seven, fifth, flat seven, five, flat three, root. Now, those same permutations of a B minor arpeggio, here's a B minor 7 arpeggio, would be starting with the flat 7, <coughs> flat 7, 5, flat 3, root, 5, flat 3, root, flat 7, flat 3, root, flat 7, 5, <coughs> root, flat 7, 5, flat three root. So here's E minor. B minor. Now let's combine them. I'm gonna go first E minor, then B minor. Wait a minute, let me do it again. E minor starting on the flat three, flat seven. B minor starting on flat seven. E minor on the five. B minor on the five. E minor on the lowered third. B minor on the lowered third. E minor on the root. D minor. B minor on the root, and we'll just end it there. So now I've got this. Ah, crap. Something like that. You hear it? So that's around an E minor chord. Ah, it's getting late. There's my leg. Now, if I didn't play all of the permutations. I could do something like this if I wanted to. Not do all of them. So starting on the root on the flat seven. Starting on the third. Now, what if I just did three of the notes? Something's wrong here. Then... 
What if I did? What if I did? Does that make sense? Something like that. So you're combining two arpeggios and then you got a lick. Woohoo! There was a blonde heritage Kenny Burrell model for sale at Dream Guitars, and I let it slip away. Really like that blonde maple with the flaming, beautiful. If you change your mind, let me know. I will, the Colonel. You're welcome. Yes, I will. Where are we at? Uh, old fashioned way of tuning. Yes. Pick up a dial at F. How do you improvise over giant steps? <laughs> Jody Aria wrote a book about that thick on that. Very carefully. I'm going to change guitars. We're going to listen to this other one and uh, can play one more tune and then we're going to call it quits. It's getting late. You guys, don't you guys have a job or anything? I really appreciate you guys coming. Please remember uh, the tip jar for my son if you so are so inclined. I definitely like to show off my guitars because if you don't get them out of the case, they fall to pieces. And uh, the thing about it is, too, uh, <clears throat> they get mad at you. You got to check their that they're being humidified properly and all that good stuff. You know what? I, I forgot about this. It's this guitar, this guitar chord. <laughs> Freaking guitar chord. It's the chord, not the jack. I took this to a gig. And I thought, oh, no, I forgot to fix that. And I plugged it in. I didn't have one problem. It's the jack. The jack, those cheap jacks, they're, they're I mean, the chord. Yeah, the cheap chord. It's like, what the heck? I'm going to play um, an original song, I think. It's on my that Jump in Java album, which you guys should get. Go on uh, guitarcollege.com and under Rich's CDs. And it's like cheap, you know, five, ten bucks, something like that. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M. It's called. It's called My Bird. Oh, no, no, it's called. No, on this, it was called Some Bird. You know, titling a song is such a hassle. And then I don't remember the name of the song. And Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Something like that. So uh, I just saw, wait a minute, Dylan Johnson. Hey, Dylan. So I, I have actually got three gigs this week. I can't believe it. It's raining gigs. I have a gig this afternoon at a, at a uh, I don't know what you call it, a retirement place, right? It's where we're all going to end up someday. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've never done one of those as a solo guitarist. So that should be interesting. And then I got a gig at a winery for dinner and playing solo guitar. And then with Dylan Johnson, who's a fabulous bass player, simply fabulous, all around nice guy. And um, Daryl Voss on drums and Charlie Shoemate, my jazz instructor from many, many years ago. Taught me everything I don't know. I <laughs> everything I forgot. But anyway, um, it's so it's going to be a fun, fun week. Um, yeah, that tune is called uh, "My Bird," and it's on that album. Yeah, the, you got to hear the chords behind it a little better, and then it it makes a little more sense. So anyway, uh, I want to thank everybody for joining me. It's been really fun. And um, come back again. We'll do it again next Wednesday. Just don't read when you're playing.
y'all come back now. You're here. See you later. Adios.